I wanted to ask you, what do you wish you knew when you first started out that you know now? So many things, but um, the first thing that pops in my mind, uh, which I think is a cloud of shame that hangs over the United States Senate, was the rules around uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment were so archaic. I mean, if, I, if somebody, if I had taken the time to like research like what are the rules and knowing that we were, here's an institution that should be leading, helping to lead the country, and it was so backwards that it really favored uh, the abuser or the harasser, protected them, and went great lengths to protect him, I'm gonna say in this case, because uh, uh, that is predominantly the case. Um, and I, I was just sort of horrified when great senators like Kirsten Gillibrand and others sort of exposed that they were where they were and, and moved a lot of folks. But I, I wish I was in the Senate four years, four plus years before uh, the Me Too movement uh, uh, reached the Senate. Yeah, so what are your priorities for the next Congress? What, what's, what's on your... Well, I haven't given up on this Congress yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have not. I'm glad I, to hear that. I am very, I am very, very happy that uh, the midterms are coming, mm -hmm. but this Congress will run through January and every day is precious and every day we're gonna fight. And sometimes it doesn't, you don't even have to pass legislation. Like I uh, wrote this piece of legislation, got Elizabeth Warren uh, to work with me on it. Um, and uh, we call the Dignity Act for Women. Most Americans do not know the, 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 the sinful things that go on in American prisons from shackling pregnant women to forcing them to, to have to buy sanitary products at jacked up prices. I, I sat with women, incarcerated women, who were telling me they, they, they were, were making their own tampons so they could save money to call their children. I mean, this is outrageous. And so we put a bill to address these issues and many more. America has one out of every three incarcerated women on the planet. And, um, and the bill really doesn't have, didn't have that much of a chance of passing in this Congress. But it was such a powerful bill that states slowly started adopting our legislation. And there's a Dignity Act in California, a Dignity Act in New Jersey. And so I'm happy that over 12 states now have picked up the Dignity Act. Many of them have made it law. I, I bumped into somebody here that worked on it in their state. So I'm going to use every single day to either try to get really good things done and through this Congress, which is hard, uh, but we occasionally will have victories, uh, or to call out injustice and to use this Congress to continue to pound. Uh, there, there are injustices in this country that are so stunning. You know, we live in a nation where, you know, people think Flint, Michigan is somehow an anomaly, but there's over a thousand jurisdictions in this country, according to Reuters, that have, uh, children have twice the blood lead levels than the kids in Flint, Michigan do. And so I'm gonna to continue to call out these injustices, put forward legislation that addresses them, and hope that either we catch fire and can get something passed, or at least can raise the consciousness or, or, or change the conversation. That's great, and I think this is something related. My next question is sort of like, what issues or topics do you think Democrats need to really engage with to get young voters of color really you know, excited and, and, and engaged? Well, I, th I think there's a lot of issues. I, I was about to say I'm a young voter of color, but I guess when you're in your 40s, you're no longer. It's like, like don't trust I somebody probably over Probably not, at least with the applications, <laughs> right? I feel like the cutoff is like 30, yeah. and I've been dealing with that recently. I'm like, oh, I'm not young. Okay. Okay. But there's a there's a 12 year old inside of me. Right, exactly. <laughs> don't look at my Netflix. Uh, what I watch on Netflix. <laughs> Netflix keeps assuming I'm a lot younger than I am. Um, so look, th there's issues that mean that impact everyone. Uh, like the cost of healthcare right now is stunning that all of us are still one injury, illness, or disease away from financial insecurity because of the way this administration has weakened the Affordable Care Act, um, driven up premiums, uh, done nothing to what uh, Democrats have. I have multiple bills uh, on, on uh, per, uh, lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Um, there's so many of these issues that make it really difficult that this country, the only developing nation that has this kind of savage inequalities when it comes to uh, healthcare disparities. And I think that those are issues that regardless of your age, regardless of your um, uh, socioeconomic status that we need to do something about, um, uh, that, that this is a call to our, to our country to cancer on the soul of our country. And another probably bigger cancer on the soul of our country is just a broken criminal justice system. Um, you know, if you're African American uh, in this country, um, you know, you are seeing people talk about these issues in your, our communities, from churches uh, to businesses, from NFL football players uh, to all of us who've been, you know, I grew up in a white neighborhood, uh, predominantly white neighborhood, uh, in an incredible community, but, you know, I got pulled over all the time compared to my uh, colleagues. But the broken criminal justice system really impacts neighborhoods like the one I live in now in Newark, where there's a massive financial impact of it, because as soon as you get tagged, one arrest, 
one conviction, your financial opportunities get crushed, um, your ability to get Pell Grants, your ability to get jobs and the like. And I, I, this is really a real issue for so many folks who fear they're one traffic stop away uh, from having their lives altered dramatically. Um, I think that young people of color um, also care just about opportunities. They want to make sure that just because, you know, New America used to be the number one nation on the planet Earth with the best social mobility. In other words, you could be born poor and make it out. Even if you were, my father, you know, he worked a full-time job back in his generation. My grandfather worked on the assembly lines at the Ford Motor Company, black man, made enough money to raise a family. And what people don't understand is now you could be a hardworking person, but you are going to not get those opportunities to break out of poverty. And so I think another issue is just, what are the pathways to economic opportunity? And whether it's like, hey, I want to start a business, I've got a great winning idea, but banks aren't loaning to people in my zip code or who aren't perceived as credit worthy. Um, I want pathways to economic opportunity. I want to know that if I work really, really hard, uh, I can rise as opposed to being stuck in a dead end job where you're working so hard just to make ends meet, you can't go to school at night, uh, or even that alone would cost you so much money because tuition's so high. I think that all kids, black, white, Latino, whatever your background is, are concerned that the bargain for my parents is not working for me. And if you look at the data, 90% of baby boomers were doing better than their parents. For millennials, it's a coin toss. It's, that's how bad it's gotten. And so for me as a guy that, uh, as the only senator that lives in a, in a majority black city, in a uh, low income neighborhood, and, and I say, uh, you know, I live in a tough neighborhood with where you hear gunshots, where you, where at the uh, local bodega, people use food stamps, uh, but are still working full-time jobs. Uh, where uh, you know, uh, you know, so many of the much of the unfinished business. I live around Superfund sites where we now have longitudinal data. Kids born around Superfund sites have significantly higher percentages of birth defects, autism, and the like. Folks in my community just want a, a fair shot, a fair chance, a justice avenues towards the American dream. And I think that we've got to start talking about the real issues that are undermining people's economic uh, prospects of life and undermining people's just basic sense of fairness uh, about what's uh, what's not working for them, or what's not working in this country. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It really resonates for me also because- Because you're first... a 20 year old uh, African American. Uh... 20, ha ha, <laughs> <laughs> plus 12. Plus 12. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I also am an immigrant. Uh, well, first generation American. My parents are immigrants and they from, came to- From where do I, I My dad came from Kenya. Okay. And my mom is from the Bahamas. Oh, right. Yeah, All so, right. you know, to keep our economic opportunity and I almost feel this guilt, which is weird because it's not my fault, but it's like you left your home countries to give your children more opportunities, but these opportunities were wiped out by people, you know, before them. So it's, I think that does really resonate with young folk and millennials and... Yeah, and I'm sorry to get like wonky on you. No, but, it's fine. But New York Times had this great piece where they compared a janitor uh -huh. that worked for Kodak in, in the past generation versus a can janitor that worked for Apple, a, nation, a, a company that now is at like at a market cap, what is it, like a trillion dollars yeah, today. Something yes, like they trillion. broke some kind of record. Um, and, and so here you have these two companies, one wealthy beyond imagination, one Kodak, um, which at the time was the way we took pictures. Yeah. And so the, the janitor that worked for Kodak actually worked for Kodak. They got to take, a janitor got to take the, the, the benefits that Kodak employees got, health benefits. They actually got a tuition re a reimbursement program. So that janitor worked, did the American dream, worked hard, played by the rules. Grit, worked, went to school at night, got a degree, moved up in the company, middle management, nothing, wasn't running the company, but really great middle class, working class existence. Now they compare that to the janitor that worked for Apple. The janitor that worked for Apple doesn't work for Apple. It works for the janitor that works for an outsourced company that has now bid to get that janitorial contract. How do they win? By suppressing wages. And now they have to, those folks are not making enough money to make ends meet. Remember, Minimum wage nowhere in America can you get, and not a county in America can you get a two-bedroom two, two bedroom apartment. And so now you have this folks that may work for Apple. First of all, they have to commute really long because you know what you're seeing is being, is in low-income housing is being pushed out of uh, uh, many communities and neighborhoods. So they have to pay for commute, commute in, work for Apple, don't get the benefits that company uh, affords, no tuition, reason, and then they get stuck. They're working harder than the generation before or as hard as that Kodak janitor did, because they're trying to catch extra shifts, they're trying to do work, weekend work, but they're not seeing pathways out of, uh, of, of, of poverty. 
And that's the, the trap of America that we need to start talking about in this country again, is that the economic bargain of our parents even, even black and brown folks back then, even women, it's just not the bargain anymore. And all, so many of these corporations are making record profits. The airline industry, I'm an airline town. You have these folks that clean the airline, that deliver the food to the airline. They don't work for the airline. And there again in these, and I know a lot of these workers that just get just get really screwed, excuse me, on benefits, on sick time, on health care, and all of these things. And by the way, you know, one of my friends named Natasha Laurel, she's amazing, I wrote about her in my book. You know, she works for IHOP, $2.13 an hour. Her kids, she has to live in, in subsidized housing. She relies on food stamps. Compare that to my grandfather who Henry Ford said, um, I'm gonna pay my workers enough so that they can buy the product that they're making. Now the irony of people that work as servers in a restaurant mm. they, that have to rely on food stamps, really can't take their kids to eat in those restaurants. And even worse, you know, one of her kids has asthma because hey, if you live in an in inner city community, your asthma rate's so much higher. And so she can't even leave her work without, she's no paid sick leave. Her son was right across the street in the hospital, across the street from our IHOP in Newark. And she could, she had to make that terrible choice, get the paycheck or be there in the emergency room for my child. So, um, so that's just a whole different bargain. And what I just want to get back to in our country is we need to get back to making the bargain work. I, I, don't, I don't want to reward laziness or sitting on the, but I, I want to say if you're willing to come here uh, to our country, if you're an immigrant, whether you're uh, uh, coming into the job workforce, if you're willing to just bust your tail, that this is a country where you can get into the middle class, you can get ahead economically, and that bargain's gone. And the other thing we just stopped doing as a country is being smart investors. You know, if you're a business and you are investing in, you're gonna invest in your physical plant, the quality of your employees, staying ahead of the competition. America used to do that. Our physical plant was our infrastructure. We had the number one infrastructure on the planet Earth. Our staying ahead of employee, staying ahead of a competition was research and development. We used to be the best R&D investing uh, 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 country in the world. Now China, outdoing us in the percentage of their GDP they invest in the technologies of the future. They know they can't beat us tank for tank or warship for warship, but they are beating us on investing in biotech, green tech, the, the innovations of the future. And then the other, the last thing is, is the quality of your employees, which used to be, was, is for a country, it's education. We, are, we used to be the number one educating country on the planet. Other countries are passing us by, early childhood education. We don't have universal preschool, but our competitors do. Our cost of college is so high, 52% of median income to go to college, but Germany is 0-4% of median income, Canada around 7% of median income. So our other countries are saying, hey, we're going to do what you guys did back in the 60s and 70s to build out your middle class. We're going to do that now while you turn your back on that and shrink the middle class and pull up the ladder for all those people trying to make it in America. It's patently unfair. Totally agree. Do we? Have, I don't think. We have, do we have any more questions? You want to have another question? I just I Hi. filibustered that last answer. Ah, I love it. <laughs> well, one thing I want to say for young people. Can yeah. I just say this message? Yes. Yeah, say whatever you want. Structurally, we got to fix this. This our democracy. Mm -hmm. Gerrymandering the, the 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 obscene, perverse influence of money in politics. And I'm hoping the young people in this election, and I'm seeing it now, more so than the people that are in Senate and the House you have these incredible candidates who are signing pledges not to take corporate dollars. So I've, I've said no corporate cash. Uh, I'm one of now six senators. I was the first five to do it, to say I'm not taking corporate contributions. I don't want people thinking that I'm the wholly owned subsidiary of a pharmaceutical company, of a, of a aerospace company, or what have you. We've got to start getting our leaders to fix these, these structurally wrong things, whether it's gerrymandering, uh, whether it's uh, money in politics, and, and definitely start fixing the lack of diversity in people running for office. And that's why I'm excited that more women are stepping up because in the Senate, we're like, people are like, yay, we've got like 20 women senators, around 20 women senators. That's like, that's not reflective of America. And so when I see people like Stacey Abrams uh, running, I, I, I'm, and by the way, she's not qualified because she's a black woman. She's qualified because she's, re I've just okay. never, I, she makes me humble. I mean, she's this incredible lawyer, running businesses, entrepreneur, and she's like a novelist. She's a right. romantic novelist. Um, amazing. She's amazing. So <laughs> you have qualified people stepping up to try to address fundamental flaws in our democracy, whether it's the money in politics or the lack of, a, of leaders on the federal level that reflect our country. We need the wealth of everybody in this country. We don't need the wealth of corporations undermining our democracy. But those structural things won't change unless we keep conscious of them. I know we're going to lower the cost of college, lower the cost of health care, uh, that we want to create better economic opportunities to success. 
but we've got to keep in mind that these things are a lot easier to fix when we fix the, the fun structural problems we have in our democracy as well. Great. Thank you. Thank that you. Was like now I'm all fired up. I'm like we'll sprint out outside and be like, fix America. Yes. And I want you to think about me in February when you have left New Jersey. <laughs> I, do you even know how to shovel snow anymore? <laughs> What's that word? Snow? Uh, I, I guess don't with under... one parent from Kenya, one parent is a Bayesian, uh, then you, uh, snow is not in your blood. No, I used to yell at my dad. I'm like, why did you move to New Jersey from the <laughs> equator? It doesn't make any sense. It's so cold. So... <laughs> You know, but yeah, it's um, been a pleasure to speak well, with you. Can I just say something now? Yeah. Because we, we didn't talk about foreign policy at all. We did and your not. your father's from Kenya, yes. which is play, needs to play a really critical role in what's going on in the South of Sudan, the DRC. We have this mm -hmm. unbelievable global crisis, humanitarian crisis going on uh, with refugees, whether they're Rohingya or what's going on in Yemen or what's going on in Syria. And we can't allow what's happening to our foreign policy is the United States is pulling back from investing in the kind of things that help uh, people in crisis and pulling back from even letting in these refugees, people who are escaping uh, incredible violence. And we have to understand that we have a moral voice that we have to uh, uh, let be heard. And it's not just about the things going on in our neighborhood, in our town, in our state, in our nation, but we've got to speak to the justice on this earth. Because what King said is true, not just for Americans themselves, but true for this whole planet Earth, which is we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a common garment of destiny. That injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And if you don't think your justice is tied up in what's happening in other places, you know, we saw what happened when you had uh, infectious disease breaking out in countries, that if America wasn't already on the ground and had the resources to help it, to contain that, we could have had a global uh, health problem. Or, uh, as I saw with an incredible leader in, in the southern part of Turkey where I was, where this incredible leader was almost getting emotional uh, talking to me about it, us cutting funding to these programs that support refugees. And she's like, look, if we don't do that, this will be a hotbed for um, radicalization and we might uh, deal with have to deal with the more expensive cost of these on the back end. So. Just want to, everybody, we're talking about local issues, but please don't forget that you're a, you're a citizen on this planet and you should be demanding for American engagement on everything from climate change to dealing with the global refugee crisis. That makes a lot of sense. What can constituents do? What can we do, right? Because I think the local news is just so... Oh, so awful. Awful. <laughs> you know? I mean, they're more concerned about Melania's jacket than, <laughs> than the famine in Yemen. I mean, it's, it's just insane what we do. So what I always find the best thing to do is to make yourself, because we all are syndicators of media. We all are now, have the, we have the power in our phones right. that entire networks, some of, some of us can post something and get more viewers than like the networks of old do or than a, a show on MSNBC or Fox will get. And, and so no, don't underestimate your power of informing your circles who then can inform. So have you posted anything about the situation in Yemen or in the DRC or in South Sudan? Have you took a couple moments to find that article that shows how this administration is cutting critical funding to deal with some of these folks and posted that information to let more people be aware of these issues? I, I just think that something I've learned about organizing, that, that, that critical to empathy, so empathy is necessary for action. And, and critical to empathy is knowledge, is knowing what's going on. And so if you want to be a, to sort of ignite that righteous uh, 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 chain reaction um, uh, of action, comes from empathy, comes from knowledge, be someone that's getting folk woke about a lot of the other issues. And, and I always say to myself, if, before I complain about something in the world, I'm going to try to do one thing, maybe small, but sometimes just want, speaking up in one small way can, can affect that. And we saw that with... Um, when uh, uh, Nigerian girls were, were stolen. We've seen that with uh, uh, other awareness campaigns on totalitarian leaders and what they were doing. So just be a part, throw one drop into, a, into the pool of understanding and it's gonna send out ripples that you may not know that might activate somebody. Go online and, and share articles. Uh, say, you know what, I'm gonna look, I read the New York Times, for example, on my little iPhone. Mm -hmm. Go to the go to the world section and read something. Share a copy from of the article from the Economist. It, it does make a difference. And then when you have a chance to interact with a with a leader, somebody running from Congress, um, talk about them on your top three issues, but ask them about their views of the world. Because I have never thought I'd live to see a time when America was pulling so far back on its engagement, whether it's on climate change engagement, engagement tearing up uh, 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 the Iranian nuclear, nuclear deal and turning our back on our critical allies and go through all the things we're doing. Uh, and we have a president that's attacking uh, uh, NATO alliances and, and, and the like. 
be a, make sure your voice is speaking to those humanitarian issues uh, uh, that are that are that are going on as well. That's really important. I like that when you're talking about we're also citizens of the world. Yes. And, and I remember what I do like to do also is international media because yes. very often oh, the they have a different yeah BBC international like not even just BBC America right like just see what other outlets are doing and saying about us and what's happening and how they're being impacted. So. so let's end with a quote from Gwendolyn Brooks. All right. Where she said, we are each other's business. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's magnitude and bond. And I really do believe we, we belong to each other. And we've got to, we've got to start showing that kind of love to each other, no matter if you live next door or live on the other side of the planet. So true. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Right, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course.